Welcome to Explain to Shane. I'm your host, Shane Tews at the American Enterprise Institute. On this podcast, I interview tech industry experts to explain how the apps, services, and structures of today's information technology system work and how they shape our social and economic life. Jim Harper is a colleague of mine at the American Enterprise Institute. A lawyer by training, I met Jim when he was exiting his job as counsel for the House Judiciary Committee. Jim also served as counsel for the Senate Government Affairs Committee. Before joining us at AEI, Jim worked at the Competitive Enterprise Institute and the Cato Institute, where he wrote on the intersections of business, technology, and public policy, including privacy, surveillance, data security, telecommunications, and cryptocurrency. These are the same issues that he focuses on at AEI as many of them are front and center in our world of technology policy today. Jim also has a long history of policy work around cryptocurrencies, including being Global Policy Council for the Bitcoin Foundation. This is where we're going to focus our discussion today on the digital dollar and how we can migrate more U.S. citizens to a digital economic existence. So, Jim, COVID-19 generated a renewed interest in the digital dollar, and Congress has actually had some hearings on it recently. Can you just explain the basics to us here? What is the digital dollar? The idea of a digital dollar has been percolating around for a while, but it really took off with the COVID-19 and the economic stimulus measures that that Congress took, where it was quickly discovered that it's awfully hard to distribute payments to a lot of people, even though the IRS has information about all taxpayers, pushing money out to them is not easy to do. There are really sort of two digital dollar conversations going on in, in tandem. The thing that spurred things was a proposal that was introduced in the Senate to create a digital dollar and give everybody accounts run by the Fed from which they could access their digital dollars. That was put forward by Sherrod Brown from Ohio. But that was really quite similar to the e-money that we have now. You transfer it through your bank or Venmo or PayPal or any other thing. The real digital dollar, if you will, or the really interesting digital dollar is a truly tokenized dollar where you aren't passing it through a bank or other financial services provider, you're not passing it to the Fed. So there's a dual conversation. The urgency in Congress to get people stimulus funds has sort of raised the tide for both discussions, but I think most interestingly, especially for the true tokenized digital dollar. What I understand you're saying is there's currently not a seamless system where we use the routing numbers into banks with the Fed to touch individual taxpayers. Is that the kind of the first challenge? Yeah, the system's pretty clunky. There are a lot of taxpayers and benefit recipients who don't have bank accounts. And so they're having to send in money orders or receive checks and take them to check cashing and that kind of thing. So particularly at the lower end of the economic spectrum, not everybody's lined out with a solid bank account that they can use to to make and receive payments. Sherrod Brown's proposal was to have the Fed create bank accounts for everyone. So it would actually sort of be another competitor with the existing banking system. You'd possibly go to the post office to do your banking if you were using these types of accounts. So the Senate legislation, is that asking us to all get a federal banking account as part of the response? That seems, to use your word, clunky, Jim. It would be a big change in in how things work. The Fed is not at all equipped presently to perform retail financial services. The post office is not prepared to do much more than money orders right now. So that is a huge step to create that kind of digital dollar. And I don't think it would actually be much of an improvement relative to a tokenized digital dollar over what we have now. Again, PayPal, Venmo, and all your banking apps and things like that. So the digital dollar is more interesting is the tokenized digital dollar. It's a digital representation of coins and notes, which you could actually pass hand to hand or phone to phone. So that's version two of the digital dollar discussion. Tokenized dollar, how does that work? Well, it's tough to explain because sometimes token is just a metaphor and there isn't actually a real digital token going around. What it is, is is it's, it's a technical infrastructure that would allow treatment of dollars digitally exactly the same as they're treated in paper. So you'd be able to hand a $20 bill to a person using your phone you know, Bluetooth connection or expose a uh, QR code to them or whatever the technology would be. And $20 in value would move from you to this other person, just like pulling a $20 bill out of your billfold and handing that to them. So tokenized is is really metaphorical because what's under the hood could be any number of, of things. But the idea is having something 
that you can hand over to somebody without going through a bank, without going through the Fed. And that has a lot of important consequences for privacy and security, for example. It also sounds like you get the middleman out of quite of these transactions, which is usually a big friction point, which also means the, on those friction points are usually a point percent, as in pennies, or you know, to the transaction. So is there pushback in that area too? Because it sounds pretty cool if you and I are able to put money back and forth with each other, which we do with Venmo and others. But now that we've got the government involved, there's a lot of middle players who are used to getting a skim on that. Does it take that out of the equation? It could reduce that, certainly. There are costs no matter what you do. It costs money to print bills and, and mint coins. It definitely costs money to do payments now. I saw a chart some years ago, and I think there's something like seven participants in a, in a credit card transaction. That's you know, seven pops on the chain to try to make a credit card payment. Everybody gets a little bit of it. And so you see percentages into the single digit percentages of payment costs, which is billions and billions of dollars per year across the country. So getting rid of a lot of those costs would be a real benefit from a digital dollar in any format. And a tokenized digital dollar could be quite inexpensive to use. And so that would drive payments costs down overall. It would certainly, and I think this is one of the one of the impetuses for the proposal, it would certainly lower the cost of financial services at retail. It's still ridiculous that now few of us aren't doing it anymore, but it's still ridiculous how much you have to pay at an ATM to get your money out. If you are at the low end of the economic spectrum and you're able to take out $60 to do your grocery shopping, you might be paying 3 or $4 in some places to get access to your 60 That's a, a tremendous percentage for a poor person to have to give up just to get access to their cash. So a digital dollar could help with that. Now, of course, that means you've got to make sure people have phones in their hand or other technology that can support using digital dollars. But on net, I think you'd find that the digital dollar system would be cheaper for retail use and thus better, especially for people at the lower end of the economic spectrum. So what is the current suggested answers to the unbanked? How do we get them into this system? Well, there are a lot of options. One that springs to mind for me is to reduce the amount of, because of my policy interest, reduce the amount of financial surveillance. It's costly to maintain the records that are required under U.S. federal law. It's costly to require identity, proof of identity, to get accounts. Again, people who have suffered homelessness or addiction and things like that often don't have the documentation they need to get the modern ID cards and things like that. But our system at the operational levels is kludgy, and it's expensive because there are so many actors and, and so many hands or, or businesses involved. So again, this is a potential for driving down those costs, which just naturally would, would help the unbanked. The proposal for a system run by the Fed would probably be tax subsidized. So it would be cheaper on the retail side, but not necessarily cheaper and better overall. So how does the digital dollar differ from cryptocurrency such as Bitcoin? So I'll speak in terms of the tokenized digital dollar. I'm an advisor to the digital dollar project. That may be one of the sort of leading digital dollar discussions, though I don't think it's necessarily the only one. The Digital Dollar Project has put out a white paper arguing that there are a lot of benefits to a digital dollar, that it's a way of upgrading our payments infrastructure, that it would maintain the primacy of the dollar globally. And the project has refrained actually from selecting a technology, though I think it's fair to say that it's inspired by blockchain technology, which is the technology that underlines Bitcoin. They haven't selected a particular technology, but instead, I think smartly, have put forward the characteristics and are going to sort of build out what the characteristics are that you want in a digital dollar and then see what technologies satisfy those characteristics. I'm attracted to to blockchain, of course, because I can see a number of benefits to it, including kind of open data, security benefits. It has characteristics that I think are good for public projects because you could run fully open source software that people are able to audit themselves, and that would create good oversight dynamics and things like that. But again, the Digital Dollar Project hasn't selected a technology, and you could run run something entirely centrally, but you would get certain costs from that, such as a breakdown in the system if the centralized operator hasn't got it right, and also surveillance costs and things like that. I'm actually looking at the report right now, and I like one of their key tenets is that their future 
proofing by not choosing a particular technology that allows for innovation, which is the baseline of how the internet runs in general. So um, that's that's definitely good news. They also note in here that they are monetary policy neutral. So that means that they stick to the U.S. dollar or what does that mean? Well, I think what they mean is that the digital dollar is not meant to have an embedded monetary policy, but it should be able to support whatever monetary policy the Fed and other governing bodies want to implement. I think a real benefit of the digital dollar, something, again, the the tokenized type digital dollar, is the ability to implement monetary policy in new and different ways. We are currently in a time when the Fed regards it as important to have liquidity with the dollar. So they've pumped a lot of funds into the U.S. economy. Advisable or not, let's put that to one side. That has gone out and and in past, any push of dollars into the economy goes out through the banking system. And to some extent, it makes it out into the general economy. If you had a tokenized digital dollar, well-designed, there's the possibility of true helicopter money, as they call it. That is taking each account out there and adding 2% more dollars to it so that everybody feels a little more flush. And maybe everybody goes out and spends a little more. They could do that directly. They call it sort of transmission of monetary policy rather than push trying to push monetary policy through the banking system to reach the real economy. You might be able to affect people's pocketbooks directly. That could could really enable monetary policy. Though so again, I'll put to one side whether whether some of those policies are are necessarily good or not. Never thought I'd hear you be a trickle up economics guy. <laughs> I put to one side some of the merits of some of those ideas. Saying it's out there, I appreciate. Thank you for the caveat. (laughs) So this report says that, you know, you've described tokenized. Then it says programmable and decentralized. What do those two parts of this equation mean? A tokenized dollar could be programmable in much the way blockchain-based currencies are, like Ethereum or Ether. Any number, if you with with the right basic platform, and you're right to analogize this to the internet's TCP IP platform, the right platform would enable all kinds of financial innovations, whether it is multi-signature controls on money so that you could pass funds and secure them almost for free, all kinds of techniques for entering into contracts or, you know, surety relationships and insurance and all kinds of different things you can do through software and starting to replace a lot of financial services with software which is a real opportunity. It's a real opportunity to cut down on costs and to bulletproof some of these systems because you can take existing financial processes and write them into code and make them run much more cheaply and ideally make them well secured against any kind of hack or any kind of crack. We have to have a change in regulation to allow that. I mean, I really appreciate the idea that software is much easier to innovate upon and change and and morph into newer things that can include policy. Do we have regulatory barriers to that right now? There are undoubtedly myriad regulatory barriers. You would be replicating a lot of existing financial services. So in one sense, software-based financial services would fit already into what's come before. But invariably, there are different dynamics to how the technology works versus how the existing payments and transfer technologies work. An illustration from the cryptocurrency world is taxation of Bitcoin transfers, when you move in and out of fiat, buy Bitcoin or sell Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency, the IRS treats that as a property transaction rather than a currency transaction. And it has really issued some mushy statements to try to interpret what happens when someone creates a new coin from your existing coin. So you have a second type of coin that exists in parallel to the first. Are you taxed on it from the instant it's created? Are you taxed on it based on a new basis when you actually use that coin, et cetera, et cetera. There are a lot of, going to be a lot of parallels between current financial services and software-based financial services, but there are going to be some of these disparallels where regulation will stand in the way and that underbrush should be cleared out in order to allow this innovation to occur. So I'm totally with you on the potential for the technology being much more efficient than our current currency system, but I'm going to just generalize and call them the cops, <laughs> the federales. What do we do to make sure they're very interested in the whole money laundering aspect? And candidly, I am too, because I've watched way too much Narcos and a bit of Ozarks and a lot of other shows that tell me, you know, I'm fascinated with that. What do we do to appease their concern that this will become a, we'll say, dark web asset? 
Well, that's a tough conversation that I think is is coming up because one of the, I suppose, fundamental distinctions between a tokenized dollar and a paper dollar is that a tokenized dollar can be transferred across time, sorry, across space, not time quite yet, where physical I'm dollars can't. Get that time element, I'm going to be fascinated by that. Well, these, these coders will figure something out to transmit across time. You're going to be able to move potentially large amounts of value across long distances, including state and national borders, without any of the effort that it takes to move you know, $100 bills and $20 bills. So money will be easier to move around under a tokenized dollar. And obviously, we have a rather substantial infrastructure of surveillance that relies on money being a little bit hard to move around. If you want to move it quickly, you have to go through a, a bank or other provider that's regulated and that provides surveillance services to the government. And if you don't want to do that, you have to actually deal with bulky and heavy dollars or gold or whatever else. So this is one of the basic differences between a tokenized dollar and a physical dollar. So there will have to be a discussion. And I think that the best approach right now is to have technology that could implement whatever the policy ends up being. So a base technology that can support fully anonymized payments and payments that are subject to certain levels of surveillance and even blocking for OFAC purposes, Office of Foreign Assets Control requires people not to trade with folks in Iran and other places that are terrorist organizations or what have you. There's going to be a lot of challenge in a digital dollar to nest those kinds of policies with the technology, but the technology should support anything. And then the policy discussion will get hammered out. I would love for there to be a nice, clear debate. I don't suspect there will be a nice, clear debate on the actual costs and benefits of the financial surveillance regime we've got now. I don't think it actually has a very big payoff relative to the billions of dollars worldwide that are spent on it. That's an interesting point. And when they do start to break down these regulations, I want that to be called the Walter White brother-in-law caveat for all my Breaking Bad fans. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you and I have... I'm going to say we're observers. Neither one of us have a strong opinion that, you know, Facebook tried to put something together, which makes sense when you know how much of Facebook people are actually in areas where they're unbanked. And they tried to do this without tethering it to a particular asset as the U.S. dollar. Do we see anything with that kind of global backing? I know that I give them super props for getting in there early and trying to make this work out. And they've gotten a lot of criticism, but is there there's some good coming out of the proposal that they're working on and, and getting us moved to that from a global perspective, especially for the unbanked? Yeah, I think uh, Libra sort of, you know, you might credit Bitcoin and cryptocurrency first and then Libra and then China for spurring forward the discussion in a serious currency country like the United States. The potential in you know, all the things I just mentioned is it ranges from modest to significant. Facebook has something special, and that's a user base. And the original version of Libra was to sort of have sort of a basket of currencies. And if I recall correctly, they've now moved to where they're going to have a bunch of stable coins. That is a token that represents a dollar and a token that represents a Swiss franc and a token that represents a euro, whatever the case may be. It has helped spur the conversation and move things forward. I wish Facebook and Libra the best. I'm interested in anything that brings progress, especially because... In places outside the United States, where the financial services infrastructure is frankly quite poor, it's holding back those economies. And that is unfortunate on humanitarian grounds, and it's unfortunate in national security grounds. There are lots of places in the world that I'd love to see have the economic development so that there's a rule of law, so that they can secure their own internal country, so that they can be safer international actors. I think there are real benefits to be gotten, perhaps by loosening up a little bit on the financial surveillance regime so that there can be economic development that flourishes. I think Facebook fell on the wrong side of that and was really beaten up by, I should say Libra, because it's Facebook has started the project, but it's not Facebook per se that runs Libra. Libra got on the wrong side of that and has, has dramatically scaled back what they were hoping to do. But there is a future out there where good people across the world are able to trade using digital currency and they're able to lift themselves up using this technology, which can easily be truly global and truly beneficial to markets and to freedom around the world. Yeah, I think they definitely had the best of intentions, but the basket of financial instruments was <laughs> maybe the people that they had in there were too smart. We need to bring, bring in some people that are dealing with the people in Africa that are using their mobile minutes as units of currency, which is another fascinating topic. 
Well, Jim, thank you very much. I know you've written a lot on this topic. We look forward to seeing more and please plan on keeping us informed on how things are going on the digital dollar. I look forward to more opportunities to explain to Shane. Thanks for joining us on another Explain to Shane. 